Hello and welcome to a new interview uh, from our series of citiesabc.com. Today we have with us uh, Christophe the Spiel Dealer, um, and I probably didn't spell it right, um, that is joining us uh, actually from Spain. Um, and we are here to talk about ideas, innovation, and this new uh, company, Threefold. So this podcast um, the, is part of the platform Cities ABC that, that uh, is, is focused on highlighting global thought leaders and um, people that are changing the world and looking at the biggest problems that we're facing. And as well, understanding how we can actually use new technologies and development to create uh, meaningful solutions that can actually uh, make us go forward and leapfrog uh, towards all the problems that we're facing as humanity. Um, in terms of, I want to start before I talk a bit about Christophe with a quote that um, that I, I'm I'm thinking and I think it's interesting to to start probably as a, the point of uh, introduction to Christophe is. The value of an idea lies in, in the using of it. And this is from Thomas Edison, and he was one of the most prolific uh, inventors ever. So Christopher is a humanist and as well an entrepreneur. Um, like as is trying to focus in making the world a better place, which I think we need, especially when it comes to technology. And as well, it's been since childhood focus on computers. And as well, um, you can say, I think you call yourself a uh, ner nerd. I think we are all a bit of a nerd, but it's interesting. And uh, so um, from Belgium, graduated in Ghent, uh, has been building different uh, platforms and, um, and the different organizations. And some of the organizations with PSI Net uh, that uh, Christopher founded, what eventually became the Accelerated Incubate. And as well now has built the new platform Threefold, um, and which is a very ambitious project that that intends to create a peer-to-peer -peer internet system and uh, based in a lot of models that are really critical for the internet and for all the challenges we have right now with data, privacy, and a lot of other elements. So welcome to our podcast series, uh, Christophe. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me to this podcast. Thank you. So um, I'm particularly interested in, the, in the, the different areas of your profile, but I think starting by the, the basis, and I think you are the first Belgian who you are interviewing, so it's always good to have a, a bit of culture background, uh, who you are, where you're coming from. I think I always start by that, but for me it's critical. Uh, and I think this is as well profile interviews. So if you could, just a bit of introduction about you, your background and so forth. Our pleasure. So indeed, I like to call myself an earth engineer. Um, when I was nine years old, I was much more interesting, um, interested in my computer than the people around me, which is maybe not the nicest thing. But anyhow, I was always very excited about technology and internet in general. So when I came out of university, I was lucky that the internet was just at that point when everything started. And I ended up working for a global um, internet service provider, the first one actually, which indeed was called PSINet. And that allowed me to right away get into the internet. We could build out data centers. We did some world records, which was really cool. And um, around 2000, we started a series of companies. So about of the companies we created, six of them have been acquired. And that led me to sort of about 10 years ago, where I was kind of in my midlife crisis, let's say. And we sort of said, okay, what do we do now? Uh, is, are we just going to create a new company? Are we going to do the same thing all over again? Or are we going to do something potentially more meaningful for the planet? So we de decided a lot there and we basically um, were always very excited, like I said, about the internet. And we realized that the internet is rather broken. So our idea was how can we as a person and, as, and use everything we have learned uh, to basically try and create a new internet. And that's where we are coming from. Oh, that's uh, that's quite impressive and very ambitious as well. So I, I think uh, let's start with your base and in terms of uh, the the background in Belgium as well. The first uh, you graduated from the University of Ghent, but as well you like you said you work with a lot of companies and some of the companies that were part of your ecosystem were acquired by giants like Oracle, Sun Microsystems, and uh, a lot of other big big companies, Terra Mark, from various on along with others. So can you tell us about that background that made who you are and as well from the nerd and from the nine years old nerd that built all of this? How did you come up and build the, the first companies and, and as well probably from the inception of the internet to where we are right now? 
it's an interesting, I hope, story. But let's say I started as a services guy, not as actually someone who created products. Uh, we were building a new internet data centers. We were at that time, right? And we were, um, yeah, hosting all these huge, big projects, which were at that point sort of being born. And that was really exciting. But it was, I saw that it was super inefficient. And of course, as an engineer, you always want to improve things. So at that time, I was like, okay, how can we make sure that we use the hardware better, that we can get to these world records, and how do we do that, and how do we improve it? And I figured out that there was so much room for improvement. And then we went into sort of these startups. And I remember one of my first investors, he told me, yeah, but Christoph, coming from a services guy, most people can never make the switch to technology, you know, because you have to create a product, it needs to be good enough, it's very different than just doing services. Of course, as a young, ambitious guy, you are like, no problem, I can do this. Of course, I know how to go from services to uh, basically a product. And I almost didn't. It was at the time when 2002, we had the crash of .com. There was no funding anymore. Uh, lots of things became very tough. And we had it a couple of times in, in our life that you go through these moments where things get very tough. But one of the things I realized rather quickly is that you have to be, stay very close to your values and to your friends, let's say. And if you always go forward and keep on pushing with enough options, then eventually it will happen. So we had a very interesting career where working with investors and they also let me do things sometimes even wrong, but then we could recover. And it became sometimes even a little bit of a cowboy story. Uh, at one point in time, they even fired me as a CEO, my board, and they were right to do so. But it made me to who I am because uh, I could choose at that point, sort of say, oh, they're wrong, uh, I am the perfect CEO, but no, they were right. So I learned from it, yet still, uh, I jumped on a plane, went to the US, and I sold my company. So I was basically like, oh, I'm stubborn. If they don't let me be a CEO, let's still uh, sell my company and prove them that way that, uh, that I am right. So it was an interesting, like, what was it, like uh, 14, 15 years in which we started companies, created companies, were successful, had some companies in parallel. And even in Belgium, um, at one point in time, we had four big American companies in our building because of exits we did. And that was, of course, very interesting. But then, yeah, you realize after a while, it's all good. And we, we learned how to work with investors and how to build products and how to learn from the mistakes we make. But then it was just not good enough, you know, you want to do something more, something more meaningful. And that's how we came to who we are today. And I was married with Isabel, which was my, my second wife. Isabel was very sick and she almost died. And that's kind of for me a turning point where it was like, wait a minute, we need to do things differently. We need to put the planet first. We need to, we need to use what we have learned and the resources we're having and the people we know to build something which is of benefit of the planet. And that's basically how we came from a pure tech guy being very passionate about startups, creating new things, creating products, proving the world, sometimes also a little bit of ego, I would say, proving the world that I can do better or the team can do better to a different side where we try and work with partners to build a better future for a planet. That's wonderful. And I think really we need that more than ever. So I want to touch a bit of just top level from your experience uh, and the, probably from your failures, because I, I really respect the failures. And I think uh, on that, I'm a bit American. I think the more failures you have, normally the, probably the more resilient you are as well. <laughs> of course, you don't have a lot of failures, but I think normally for, for every success, there's a lot of hard work and a lot of things. So do you want to just uh, highlight, not the failure, but probably the, the struggle that you had until you, you come up with, to the, this present moment as well? Okay, how many hours do you have? I can talk about the failures. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> just just <it's>, top level. <laughs> but I do agree. Uh, is, is it really failing? Can we even call it failing, right? It's, it's at the end, walking apart is there are many options and you need to follow them to get somewhere. And it's kind of normal that you will be on paths which are not leading anywhere or based on ego maybe or whatever other reasons you can make mistakes which afterwards blow up in your face. Maybe there are some which are worth mentioning. As an example, I mentioned at one point in time they fired me as a CEO because I kept on selling. I kept on sort of talking about how good we were and what we could do and whatever. But at one point in time that stops, right? 
But then you also have the positive coming out of that. They gave me a sort of chairman, which then that kind of teached me how to deal with that and how to do better and how to learn from that issue in, in, in setting perceptions, right? So indeed, to me, every failure which happened is an opportunity to better and, and, and to turn it around. But yeah, look, there were many things. Yeah, there is about how do you deal with the board. I think another one I had was um, when things went really, really, like really too crazy and too fast, it was too easy for me to fundraise. And you get a lot of money and you become a little bit maybe over ambitious and get too many companies. At one point in time, I had like more than 15 companies running in parallel, not all high profile, but then you overstretch yourself too thin, right? And you get on too many boards and too many things. And then obviously it becomes much harder uh, to keep on, on, on managing everything. So that was another mistake I've made. But yeah, there were many. But sometimes a mistake also becomes beautiful. I remember at one point in time, this was not a mistake, but I had to downsize a company by three. The board put a milestone and it was, if you can't meet that milestone, you will have to, cost, you have to cut costs dramatically. So we did, but you know what happens? It was incredible actually. So I was doing that because at the end you work with your friends in a company and I had to let two thirds of the people go. I was with tears in my eyes. You see everything. You know what these people did? They basically made a song, We Will Survive. And they basically worked for, most of them worked for many more months to give a new start. And there you can see that something which almost looks like, oh, we're not going to make it, turned around in a beautiful company, actually, and it got a nice exit. And then you had these people doing this extra thing because we always stayed close to them and to building these values. So, yeah. I wouldn't then even call them failures, right? We, we learn from um, challenges and that teaches us how to do better. And yeah, that's where we go. Oh, that's wonderful. And I think it's very important. So one, one of the things I would like to touch as well. So like you said, when you start your career, you start in working for infrastructure and a lot of companies that were probably the beginning of the internet. And now you're creating a new internet. So, um, so it's quite an ambitious as well and shows as well the, the scope of your capacities as well, the ambition of the work. But I, I would like to hear from your experience. Uh, um, and like you said, the, the internet at the moment is very broken. Um, we have a lot of different layers. But the, for instance, from both an entrepreneurial uh, uh, level and from a, uh, as well an investor because you have the incubators, so you've been just as three aisles that are all working together. And in the end of the day, we are all part of this in one way or the other. Um, but so how do you see this evolution of the internet in the last 20 years? That is probably uh, part of your career as well. And the challenge we're facing right now, but how did you come here? I would like to hear your opinion, especially as someone that is a technologist. You're not only just the founder and the CEO, but you are a strong technologist as well. So I think if I understand you well, the question is about, okay, how did we get here with this broken internet and are there some yes. certain trends? And, yeah. Um, look, the internet was really beautiful huh? in the beginning. It was something amazing with a huge potential. And, but like everything which has a huge potential, you go over a certain curve, the hype cycle, and then things will calm down. And it happened for the first time, obviously, in the dot-com crash 2002 where uh, then everything settles again. And now with blockchain, it kind of goes again. Now, the, where, where it went a little bit wrong is that in the beginning, it was only connectivity and it was a little bit, yeah, was, as was be, to be expected, naive, I would say, right? People just connected the cables and it was a true peer-to-peer -peer movement in the beginning and, and rather free. And everyone was experimenting and the internet was not that big and it led to something really beautiful. Now, where it started going wrong is that when these huge massive data centers came and these big giant companies basically made us a product. So today we, are, we don't exist on the internet once, we exist 100 times. And um, to use a quote from Elon Musk, but he says we are a cyborg. And I do agree with that, the phone or the computer makes us a cyborg. We cannot live without that thing anymore. It gives us superpowers, right? We can do things we couldn't do before. But if you think what happens, we now exist 100 times on the internet. We exist in a Facebook or a Google or we exist everywhere. And that brings the full, um, a lot of side effects with it. First of all, every time you exist, there is a full infrastructure behind it, right? And these infrastructures are big. 
uh, every time we exist, we exist as a product. They don't give this to us just to make us, to give us something for free. There is a reason, right? They give this to us because that way they have a business model they can execute upon. And this way of organizing the internet, we getting things for free and we becoming part of this massive, big place made the internet to what it is today, which is that very few companies in the world actually own more than 80% of the internet capacity. So the storage, the applications, everything around that. And this is not something good. It's very weird if you think about it to make an analogy with electricity, right? The internet is something everyone needs to have. It's something like reading and writing 30, 40 years ago. If you don't have access to internet and the information and the opportunities it delivers, it's the same as not being able to read and write so many years ago. Yet still today, the internet is there only for half of the world properly, which already is very wrong. So there are no equal chances. Secondly, that internet is produced in very few locations. Imagine it's like electricity. Well, it would be the same like we are consuming electricity in Europe from somewhere produced in China. I'm just saying something. That doesn't make sense. Everyone needs to have their internet produced close to them because at the end, it's like an energy. We need that ability from the internet, how we can communicate, how we can work together, how we can um, yeah, share things, how we even digital currencies now. It's so important in our current life that these services need to be structured in a different way. They need to be structured around us. They do not need to be structured around a centralized company somewhere which can use that to build a huge big thing out. It's a wrong paradigm which is breaking the internet. It needs to be rethought. It needs to be done in a way that we say, oh, wait a minute, I am the center of my internet. It's my data. I am the application, right? And everyone now communi communicating to each other should be able to do that directly amongst each other. It's not normal that you need to remember, okay, did I use WhatsApp or Telegram or SMS or mail to communicate? This shows that it's broken. You shouldn't have to have to remember how you communicated with someone and how to integrate all of these things. Imagine you are the one app, you, not a company, and all the things you need to have on the internet is linked around you. Can you see how that would hugely simplify your digital life, how it also would consume a lot less energy? Now you could just talk to what we call your digital twin and say, hey, digital twin, I need to travel or I want to go somewhere or I need to find an apartment. And it just figures it out and it just happens. And if you send a message, you don't have to know if it's WhatsApp or Telegram or something. You just talk to your, to your bot basically and you say, look, tell this to my friend or you write a text message to your bot, which will then send it to someone else directly. This centralization is not needed. So we need actually a very different way of how to recreate and reconstruct this internet, which is very different than what we know today. Did that answer a little bit the question you were having? Or it's no, too no, abstract? Completely, completely. No, 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 it's, it's very important. So I have a lot of questions on that. Uh, but before we go deep, and of course, I know that this is the reason why I create Refold. So definitely what you talk, it's completely clear. And I think it's even more dangerous right now because uh, we have not only a total control of the internet by a couple of few organizations worldwide that have total control of the internet, but not only the internet, but the data, the privacy settings. And even in some cases, they have much more cash flow than now governments, if you look in a lot of different ways. And as right. well, we have very little to say around that, point one. But at the same time, the challenge we have right now is that we have a very broken uh, um, or we have a completely crazy geopolitics again, which is nothing in history of mankind. But at the same time, um, it's more tricky in the sense that, we, like you said, we are becoming cyborgs. So that means uh, a huge part of our um, uh, activities are based on technology. Most of this technology provided by these big giants. But then our governments that, that kind of manage all our identity, all our services, um, are becoming less and less advanced. So we have a paradox between having almost a, a rule based by corporations and the rule that is the, the kind of the the day-to-day -day rule that is our countries, our cities, and so forth. So yes. how do you see that? Because in order that you're ambitious to grow a new technology and a new internet, it's wonderful, and I love the visions, and I will talk about the, the vision that we have for Threefold. But 
first of all, how can we address that? And I'm, that is probably, it comes yeah. to the reason why you create threefold, but I'd like to hear your vision because we have to look yeah. at especially these two angles before we move forward because technology doesn't solve the problem in itself. But actually technology is and the issues as humanity probably, if you put it that way. No, you're absolutely right. The, the, these big new companies become, became like the new governments, if you want. Now, first of all, let's start. I also believe, just like you mentioned, technology is not the answer to a lot of things. It's just a necessary requirement to get somewhere. It's a tool, but it's not the solution or it's not the thing which will save everything. What can save us are us, people. I do believe in the good of people. We are all born as beautiful people. We are. And we kind of get brainwashed in a certain way um, by whatever, by fear, by ego, by maybe superstars we admire, and we go in a certain direction. But fear, for sure, is a very powerful um, force in our lives. Yeah? Being afraid not to have the right job or not finding the right uh, partner or there are so many things which basically get us to go in a certain direction. So if you look at this world, yes, the world has some challenges. And I think we all agree that certain things need to be upgraded. I call it we need more awareness or more consciousness. Now, you can see this on the physical level. We need better energy usage or we need to have better ways how to produce energy or water or all of these things. But it's also about self-reflection. How can we make sure that we as a person become different? Because today everyone is blaming someone else, it seems like, right? It's like, oh, it's the government. It's this, that. Yeah, but... I believe we need to look at ourselves first because we have choices. We can tomorrow choose to not buy a certain product or we can tomorrow choose to ignore a certain source of information because it's not reliable or we can choose to communicate in a different way. If we would change the way how we do things, everything in the world would change after tomorrow. So the key in change is in all of us. It's, we don't have to wait for a government to do something. But unfortunately, it's very hard for people today, even if they believe they can ch make change, it's hard to find the right mechanisms how to do so. And that's where we come in. First of all, we're not doing this for ourselves, nor for just a company. Everything is open source. We're doing this as a movement. We have a nonprofit behind. We have also a technology company, yes. But we're doing this for helping the planet with a lot of people. I'm absolutely not alone, of course. We're having a community of people who like this to happen. And together, as a planet, we need to make this happen. We need to own this new internet. Now, to follow my threat about we as people need to become in our power. We need to accept that we have a responsibility and we need to take that responsibility. But for that, we need a new system. Because the internet is the easiest way how we can communicate and can find information. But if the internet is broken or not everyone has access to it, we're stuck. We basically became a little machine in a big artificial intelligent driven um, thing if we're not careful. Actually, the Matrix, uh, the movie, could become reality in less than 10 years from now. This is no joke. This is how fast we are going with technology. People are thinking about putting things in your body and communicating that way and so on. It will give us superpowers. But one of the possible ways could be that we become a little part of a really big machine. But this is not what we should be nor have. So what needs to happen is actually not that complicated. It's by taking our digital future back in our hands, where we have our data, where we have our own apps, where we have control over who, how we talk to who. We empower people to actually make a difference and to stand up against things they don't believe in and to say, yeah, we're not going to buy this anymore. We're not going to accept that thing which is being pushed onto us. And we just give them a way to be themselves. But for that, we need a new digital substrate, a new digital platform, which allows us without being hijacked or being made a product, which allows us to communicate, be ourselves. Think about people in refugee camps. How many millions of people are not in refugee camps with no hope for the future? They have no access to money. They cannot do their KYC to get onto a bank. They cannot have a proof of ownership or this or that. They, they basically are made economically, they are dead. Well, this is crazy. By giving them a new internet, which, by the way, we can do for less than a dollar a month, these people can now have back access to digital currencies, information, provide services again, have an economic means, all of that. And this can be done literally in a couple of weeks. So by building a new internet together, 
This is not about us. It's about together, we can re-enable everyone who needs it in the world. And as such, we can get into our power. We don't have to be afraid anymore. Or we can stand for what we believe in. So it's a much bigger thing, actually. So um, I, I want to, so I know that this is the reason why you created the uh, threefold. So before we go there, so can you tell us a bit the inception of threefold and as well, this is a crypto platform or at least it has a funding based on this. And as you said, there's an all for profit and a for profit, just the constitution and understanding how yeah. you're building the infrastructure of the company. Sure. So. There is indeed there is a, a non-for-profit foundation and that non let's first explain what the purpose is so the purpose is to enable everyone to gather to create a new internet what does that mean it's not the cables because there are quite some projects of beautiful projects actually where people already reconnect the internet or use the existing internet there is a lot of cables already as an example here in spain very close to where i live there are more than 35,000. Uh, places connected just over the wire peer-to-peer. -peer. So there are many ways that you can establish the connectivity or you can use the existing cables. So I don't see the problem there that much. Okay, it also needs to be done, obviously. So when I say about the new internet, I'm really talking about the fact that we need to have a place where our data can be, where our applications can be, and they need to be linked back to us. But that needs to be somewhere. We're not going to put them back in big central data centers, so they need to be spread out. So what we're trying to do is actually um, letting everyone connect a computer, any piece of hardware to the internet, and as such, they provide more capacity to the internet. And that way, instead of needing these huge big data centers, everyone can add capacity to the internet, and as such, our application, our digital life, can be hosted close to where we are. And then I will explain the structure, but I'll put it in another um, way. If we could compare the production of the internet capacity, storage and compute, and if we would compare this to electricity, today we would have the electricity from these big nuclear plants, which would be the data center, right? It's like the analogy to a big data center. But the data center is not here. It's often not even in our country. It's far away, right? That's how it is today. What we suggest is that we don't get all of that energy out of these central locations, but basically we all put a solar panel on our roof, and that solar panel provides energy, electricity around us. So in our case, it's not a solar panel. It's basically a computer you connect to the internet. And as such, you provide en energy for your friends, for your community to build a new internet. Now, to make this happen, we motivated people to do so. We call them farmers. We didn't want to call them miners because in a way, it's a like Bitcoin, if you want. So people can buy a box. I like a miner in Bitcoin. We call it a farmer and they provide capacity that way. So that's the purpose. To structure ourselves, basically our um, non-for-profit foundation is there to promote this idea. The idea of how can we build this internet together? How does it work? How can you become a farmer? There is a token behind. It's called the threefold token. And this token, you get it if you connect a box to the internet. That way you, you farm tokens, eh? just like mining bitcoins. And then if you sell your capacity, you get tokens again because people need to use these tokens to buy capacity from you. So this is the core model of how it works. And that's all done by a foundation. Okay? This is a non-for-profit foundation in Belgium uh, by, by law protected, so no, there is no shareholder. And this is there to make sure that everyone can farm, can get the tokens, they can sell the capacity, that there is promotion around it, and so on. And that foundation has some tokens, just like in the beginning of Bitcoin, there were some tokens mined early or farmed early, and these tokens can be sold. Uh, we did not do an IEO, we did not do an ICO, it's a very different structure. And then we have our technology company. This is a technology company in Belgium where we have developed the software, the software needed to make this happen. This software is open source, that's how the foundation uses it. Um, and as a technical technology company, I'm CEO of that company, we um, go work with partners. We have some very nice partners like HPE, Solidaridad, and others, Kleos, which is a company who does very good in 4 plus G, 5G. And basically, together, we use that technology to provide solutions to cities, governments, uh, enterprises, whatever. And that's our commercial way of our commercial company. And that way, we have income for basically paying for the development of the technology. And that company will have its own for-profit purpose. That's how it's being structured. Next to that, I have an incubator, which is basically working for these two entities mainly. We're now also creating a new company, a little bit too early to talk about that, but that will be about our digital twin. Then I already said probably too much. 
And this incubator will keep on creating new startups uh, around the ideas we're having here of the new internet to basically make it all happen. That's in a nutshell. I hope I, I could explain it, um, but that's how it's being constructed. No, no, it's, it's, uh, I, I love the idea and I think in the analogy between the foundation and the company. So, but, so just for me to understand, and I think uh, it's, it's important for the people that, are, that never heard about Threefold. So can you just explain better because you said that you're not doing an ICO or an STO, so, but you have the token. So I know that it's through the mining and I understand that it's the vision similar to, to, the, to the Bitcoin or, or even Ether, but Ether still had a, even Ether had, or Ethereum had a, an, an ICO initially. So give us a bit of the background, how you're funding that and as well how you create this ecosystem, because I think that's very important. So, but thanks for the question. Um, up to 40 million euros actually, or dollars, well, anyhow, has been already invested in the project, but how? So the first, let's say about 10 million was basically out of the incubator first startup we did just that came from my own money, money from the incubator. And that was the beginning where we got to the first versions of the technology. At that time, we called it differently. Um, it was, we called it ITS energy. Um, and this was the beginning that was creating the technology, going out, get first customers and so on. And that's how we found the first set of farmers. So farmers were people who believed in the ID and they bought hardware to basically start providing this first capacity. So it was about 10 million was the beginning. And then we have $18 million, which was invested by farmers uh, in basically putting hardware out there. So we have today 18,000 CPU cores. We have 90 million gigabytes of storage, 80, 90 million gigabytes of storage active on the internet. And that's the result of $18 million of hardware being spent by farmers to build out this internet. It's now in 21 countries. It's still a little bit too centralized. We wanted to be much more going out than more farmers, but that was another 18 million, which sort of went it going. And then we, it, that's like, we started like more than four years ago, right? Uh, by the tokens we farmed by sort of going, we, I invested also in farming equipment and the foundation did. By then tokens we were farming, right? We got a certain amount of tokens and we have been able to sell for about $5 million worth of tokens that way as well. So that was some other funding. That was not an ICO because this was literally from all the investments already done. Yeah, we are creating tokens by farming and just like anyone else actually, and we could sell those. So that gave us another five. And then uh, the last thing was another seven, which we got from basically investors in the technology company. And that's how we came to 40 in total. So that's how we managed to get to where we are today without having to do an ICO or an IEO and still be funded. And now we're looking at the next level that we will do a fundraise. And we are now doing another token distribution event where basically we work with other beautiful projects, uh, this Conscious Internet and the Alliance for Conscious Internet, where basically together with other companies, we are trying to give this new internet uh, a body, a new life. Well, that's quite impressive and is a huge amount of money as well. So that congratulations for what you achieved so far. So, so now I think I, I understand the basis. I always like to look at the foundation and especially in a project so ambitious as that. So you, you are under the, the, the European law or, under, or I'm sure in, you said that you're based in Belgium. So you have a completely different setup as a foundation and as a, an organization because the, the European law is much more, uh, you mentioned, the, for instance, the data privacy and is one of the, the DNA of threefold. Can you just tell us on that level? Then I want to go more into the project. Um, yeah, we are a Belgian company. The foundation is a Belgian. Belgian blockchain driven. Ah, oh, sorry, there was some delay. Um, yeah, so we are a Belgian company. We also have a company in Dubai and um, as well, from which from out of which we operated because I lived five years in Dubai and that we actually started it from there originally. Uh, but eventually, yeah, we now ended up with a foundation in Belgium and a technology company is also in Belgium. Belgium is it's a country I know very well, of course, and coming from there, I understand the laws very well and have my incubator there. So that was the most logical choice to do it from there. Now, I think it's a good choice because Europe has some, uh, let's say Europe has some catch up to be done, right? They are, they are behind in internet based companies and there is a lot of stuff which need to happen from there. Now, we are a global company at the end. But being there in Europe, being able to help others um, also on a global level and do that from Europe seems to be like a good, reliable way how to do that. Now, the, the foundation is operated partially from out of Dubai. It's operated from out of other. It's a very decentralized environment, actually. 
but the top of the foundation is indeed uh, sort of in Belgium. That's where we are. Yeah. Okay, that's that's uh, as well interesting, and I like the the fact that you're really building it as a decentralized system. Um, so so right now, going through the way you're going to put the vision together, because I think in order to build this peer to peer internet, and I think uh, the way you're going to use blockchain and as well as the technology is how you trying to put this in practice. I think it's really very important, and uh, and I'm actually very excited, but uh, trying to understand how you're going to put this together, because I think yeah. in the end of the day, it's about how you achieve the results. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's not an easy one to answer just by talking. Um, but actually, the best way to explain it, I guess, is we use nature as a source of inspiration. If we look today, uh, nature is at the end a result of millions of years of evolution. So there has to be something like that. And if today we look at the internet, there are two ways how things are done. Or they're very centralized. And then you have these big data centers, lots of big databases and lots of servers and all close together and high performance equipment to let things running. That's one model which is being used for the biggest part of the internet capacity, right? Then we have blockchain, which became a very other thing, a good thing, which basically showed people that you can build things decentralized, which is really good, obviously. Now in blockchain, it's good for many, many things. It's perfect for storing money. It's good to get to consensus. It's good to do smart contracts, but it's a shared mechanism. You're sharing your data with many, many people all over the world, right? Like this blockchain is replicated everywhere. So as such, we believe it's not the right solution to build a new internet upon. So we need another construct. Sure, we use blockchain technologies inside to make it possible, um, but this, this alone would not be good enough. So. What did we have to do then? So basically, we have two parts. One part is what we call the three nodes, and they are the low-level capacity. Think about it like the solar panels. So any, we had to we reinvented an operating system, and this operating system you can download on a box. Any computer you will do. Computer has hard disk, has CPUs, has memory. You download the operating system, you boot the machine, you connect it to the internet, you connect it to the power, and that's it. The box will become fully self-healing. You will not have to touch it. You don't have to be an IT expert. And the full capacity of the box is now added to the network. And by adding the capacity to the network, you get tokens. And that's what we call this farming of tokens. Now, to make this work, we had to make that layer in our solution self-healing and self-driving. And that was the hardest part. Because imagine that I, eventually there will be millions of nodes. But if people would have to manage the nodes themselves, it would never fly. It would be too complicated. It's like asking people, oh, put a solar panel on your roof, but now you need to become a solar panel expert, right? That simply wouldn't work. So we had to make that network of nodes, these boxes, we needed to make them self-healing. And for that, we had to develop software. So our operating system has no server interface. It has no user interface. And as such, there is no what they would call a hacking surface or a hacker surface. So it's much harder for hackers to basically get in because there is nothing to attach to. So that's one thing we have done. That was the biggest part of the work. This is something we're working on for so long. Also in the previous startups, we've really had to reinvent over and over again. How do you do that? How do you make something faster, more energy efficient and so on? Now, this capacity layer I'm talking about, for storage as an example, we can be 10 times more efficient uh, in power-wise compared to some other systems. So there are some real provable advantages of using our layer, basically our, all our layer, because we do this together with the farmers, which will result to a lot less energy used. So that's the base layer. Basically, think about it, solar panels on your roof, delivering electricity, in our case, IT capacity coming from a box. The other layer has to do with what we call, the technical term is called tree block, but it's basically our digital twin. So the digital twin, it's you. You now live on top of this network and all your data and all your applications and all your processes and all your things to do with your identity is now linked to you, to only one place. And you are the only person who owns that place. But this place needs to live somewhere, this bot, let's call it the bot now, the tree bot, needs to live somewhere, otherwise it cannot be. And that's where the grid comes in, so it can live on these nodes. So I said in the beginning, we looked at nature. Well, how would this compare to nature? If we look at our body, our body is an amazing machine, right? 
It's much more than a machine. It's an amazing organism. And in this organism, we have cells. And these cells would correspond to what we call these tree bolts or these digital twins. All of these cells can talk to each other independently. They can, can they need each other, but they can communicate, they have history, they have DNA, they have information, they have knowledge. And all of these cells together make up our body. But the cells cannot live without the body. And the body represents the nodes. That's where they can live because you need, the cells need to live somewhere. So it's that kind of thing how we structure this new internet. So all of these boxes would be like the body, if you want, of all the cells. And all the cells would be these digital twins. And all these digital twins can talk to each other independently from centralization. So if you want to send a message to me, then it's then basically you will not, it will not go to a central server. You will send it to your tree bot, to your digital twin. Your digital twin will directly send it to my digital twin. And that's how it will come to me. So there is no in-between, no shared medium like blockchain, no central database, no central service. Basically, all of our digital twins do all of our digital life directly to each other. And that's a very new paradigm. But to make this possible, because this needs to support billions of these tree nodes, we had to build this new digital substrate. And that's what the tree nodes form, this network of boxes. That's quite impressive. So, so you are using um, the Stellar blockchain. So can you tell us why you choose the Stellar blockchain? And at first, there's a lot of similarities between what you're doing and as well Ethereum. Uh, I want to touch that question as well. But I think you're going more on the network. So if you can, first of all, first question, why uh, Stellar? I know that is a very robust blockchain, but understand it because Stellar has been more successful on the payments part. So I'm, I'm curious to hear that part. And second, um, for if I, yeah. Yeah, so, well, look, we, had, we used to have our own money blockchain. That's how we started. It was called Revine. It was probably the first proof of block stake blockchain in the world. And we used it till uh, a little bit more than a month ago. Um, but then we kind of realized we were very early, but of course it was taking resources. And then we were realizing at a point in time, look, does it really make sense for us to maintain that money blockchain? Maybe we're better off using another money blockchain. And then we looked in sort of the top 10 of the blockchain projects. Okay, which one has like, is fast, secure, rather decentralized, um, has a low transaction fee, and Stellar was a good candidate. Now we're also now talking to another beautiful proje blockchain project, which is called Digibyte, which is even more decentralized and stuff like that. So we probably are going to work with them as well. So we look at these money blockchains as something we need for our model to work, but we decided not to do that ourselves anymore. And then we basically just, if you want, shop around and look at what really makes sense for us. We did not want to go to the smart contract platforms. And like in EOS or Ethereum, I'm sure they're wonderful projects and they are, but in our case, we wanted to have a pure song, a pure form, a money blockchain, right? Which has our only purpose is holding money, with a certain set of requirements around it, no more, no less, because for my own personal feeling, a pure money blockchain can be more safe because it's so structured around one specific use case. And that's how we came up to Stellar because they seem to fit all those requirements. We talked to the people at Stellar and uh, nice people and it looked decentralized and that's why we went with them. I'm very, very interesting. So I, I'm a huge fan of Stellar, so I just want to understand uh, why Stellar. So, so just... Um, I, I know that you have a, net, a network with the farmers and you touch that, but yeah. can you, let's say, if I'm um, an outsider and I want to engage on the, on the threefold community, so can yeah. you tell us, me, tell us, for instance, let's say from a, um, a user journey perspective, how do I use threefold? Because I, 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 I want to understand that and I think it's particularly interesting for people listening to us to understand that vision, because the vision is, is very clear about building this internet alternative internet and, and, and as well uh, um, kind of a, a much more independent internet and much more uh, as well uh, sustainable and as well um, meaningful and social impact but there's a component of the user journey and as well the business model so if you could tell us about these two parts i'm particularly curious as well yeah yes but i just remember another question i had before i quickly do that one you said about ethereum yeah, so, Ethereum, yeah, we're, yeah. yeah, we're not really like Ethereum, by the way. Of course, the idea of executing something everywhere, yes. But this is done on a blockchain level. Right? You execute something by using algorithms and code. And that has its purpose, for sure. It's very powerful, of course. 
We are living on a much lower level. On our network, you can execute anything. Anything which runs on Linux can be executed on our network. Um, anything we, we, we made our capacity backwards compatible with Docker, with Kubernetes, with uh, S3 storage and so on. So basically it means that um, everything which runs on Linux at the end can run on our network. And that's of course very different, which means it, this can, our network can be used as an alternative to an Amazon or Google, which is not the case for an Ethereum. There you have to be very specific in the workloads you can create and what it can do for you. So it, that's, that's already different. But we have these two layers. There is the capacity layer, and like I said, anything which runs on Linux uh, can run on the top of that. So today, we are still a little bit for the experts. I have to sort of um, warn maybe even the people on this call. Um, we are there for lots of, we have more than 20 plus projects today who want to come on our network or are coming on our network. And these are the first ones we are being focused on. Basically, we have uh, a tool, an SDK, a system development kit, which allows our partners to build anything on top of us. They can literally run anything on top of us, like I said, which runs on Linux. Any, we have blockchain guys coming. There are some software of office software companies. There's all kinds of things, of things which will run on top of us. Why would they do it? Because it's more cost effective. It's closer to where the users are. It's more green, like for storage, 10 times less power usage. We have the smart contract for IT. I didn't explain that. But basically, there is a very secure way how you can deploy something on this network. You can almost think about us like a blockchain for blockchains. So we are the blockchain for the hardware layer, if you want, which can be used by others to put something on top, like other blockchain companies. Actually, things like Ethereum or EOS or whatever could very well run on top of us, and we would give them certain benefits to do with performance and security and power usage. And that's what we see happening today. We have quite some blockchain companies and others considering to move their workloads on top of us. That's phase one. If you are an expert and you don't mind some scripting and looking, working with an SDK, you can use our network today to bring anything live. Over the next couple of months, we will also bring more end-user workloads on top of it, together with our partners. So it will become more use, use, easy for people to get on there, click a couple of buttons, and get your storage work, uh, living on there or get something else. That's the next step. The, after that, we will be also be focused on this TreeBot ID, the ID of the digital twin. The fact that you have this, your data and your applications running in one part, and we are inviting software developers to basically, as long as it talks JavaScript or HTML or CSS, all these web technologies, you can get this to work. Any web technology can work on top of our TreeBot. And that way we can be another platform, not at the container level, not at the Docker level, not low level, but more high level, which eventually more in the future, people can use to put their application on top, which we call the experience. And why would they do that? Because that way the person who then is part of that application um, would have ownership of their data, of their own identity. So we basically resolve the full sovereignty, like GDPR rules, uh, but also power usage. If we do it from a three-bot perspective, we can save hundreds of times of energy. So it's very compelling for our technology partners to basically use this as a backend for their applications. And that will be the next step. So these are the kind of the levels we see. Today, as an end user, you cannot do much on our network yet. Um, you, you need to be a little bit technical. You need to be able to, like an IT expert, uh, work with Docker or Kubernetes or know how to deploy something. This is our current target market. But you will see within the next couple of months more and more use cases coming on top of us, which we will then, which we then can give back to our community. That's uh, very impressive and I think very necessary. So um, I, I think the the model that you put together to put this to make this happen is it's very. Uh, well, it's, it's perfect in a lot of ways. Right now is how you can make it happen. So because you have the model, and I think if you could tell about the the, the, pil the pillars of, of threefold, uh, from equality, freedom, and sustainability, yeah. and how you put this together. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning them. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. it's, um, the three pillars of our new internet are equality. And why? Because half of the world does not have equal access to information education and all of these things. We can deliver this full stack with everything in there for less than a dollar a month, which is, of course, I think, impressive from a cost perspective. And that can enable, it depends how much capacity you use, obviously, but this can enable people in, in emerging countries to have 
equal access to the to the internet. Education is a very good one. We're working together with Kuhn, amazing person working very hard on IES. He's indirectly giving education to a million people. Now, we are helping him to basically put it on top of our network and or he's helping us as well, I guess. And that way we can do things like that, which are very meaningful. The second one is the power and the sustainability. We save a lot of energy. And the one which resonates most today for most people or governments is the sovereignty. The fact that a country or a com uh, or, a, or even a company or a person can have their data close to them. It's in their region and that gives them um, more security. And yeah, that, that's what, and it's also more, more performance huh? because if you have your workloads running close to you where you are, then everything will go much faster, especially for certain things like games or other things because there is less distance between you and where your applications run. Right, so that's where we are now. We are in an interesting situation. We are self-funded in a way, and eh, not self-funded. I mean, thanks to our friends and our community, we we came to where we are, and now we need help to go to the next step. So basically, we we created this um, alliance for conscious internet, which is a number of like-minded projects which want to also help the planet. And together with them, we are trying to fundraise tokens we got from farmers, and that will help us to do the next phase so that we can build more applications on top of this, we can create more awareness, uh, and we can actually make all of this become much faster, much bigger. But that's the kind of interesting period where we are right now. I'm very, very inspiring. I think it's really, I, I'm actually trying to see a lot of applications for the network. So in a lot of ways, and I think trying to, to pass your words and, and, and correct me, uh, it's mostly you're trying to build a, an infrastructure grid for the internet, that actually can um, scale a lot of different blockchains and put it together. That's I'm trying to summarize what you try to do. So yeah, that's at the capacity layer, absolutely. And then in the second phase, it's about giving us our digital twin, so our bot, which represents our digital life. But that will take more time. Yeah. So, so before we go to the digital twin, I have a lot of questions on that because we've been, I've been as well uh, researching and, and doing a lot of work in the idea of uh, identity and, and we're talking about identity. But before that, so for building that ecosystem that you're talking, you build an entire system of farmers. Can you tell about that? Uh, because that's a, I think it's, it's one of the fundamental bases of the platform, but I'm particularly interested how you put it together. Yeah, I'm super grateful for all of these farmers, because some of them go back quite some years now, um, where they had trust in what we were doing and they liked the ID and they were so kind and foreseeing basically to put their money to work and invest in hardware. Because at the end, $18 million in hardware, it's maybe not the end of the world, but for a startup, that's a lot of support from a lot of people to put all of that capacity in the field. And that, that, is, that was super important to us to develop our solution on top of, but also to give credibility to the world that actually we could convince enough farmers to do it. And farmers are, are I mean, they really like it. Um, it's a very good model. It has very good uh, economic incentives for a farmer, which is okay because at the end as a farmer, you, you help grow the internet and it's logical that as a farmer, you need to make money on this as well, right? So there are, like, if you go to our website, to the wiki, there are simulators. Farmers can see how they can make money by providing capacity. And that way we have been able to, actually today, we have more capacity online than the sum of all the blockchain infrastructure projects. Yeah, that's where we are today. And yeah, I have to, that's thanks to these farmers. Otherwise, that would not happen. Now we, um, the last year, we, did, we accepted a lot less farmers because we had too much capacity. But now we start with a new wave of farmers. We want to now, now our aim is to add 10,000 new locations as soon as we can. So we're inviting everyone to become a farmer. And basically you can do it completely by yourself where you just buy a box and you connect it and it goes. Uh, or you can connect the foundation and you can get some help there or even become certified uh, by doing so. Amazing, and I think it's really so. I, I want to pick. Uh, I think I like the the letter that you wrote to to Tim Burns Lee, um, and I think that that touches <laughs> as well. Did you find that one, Dan? <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm a, I have a kind of detective part on me, uh, so so I think just just uh, looking at that letter, and I think it's it's a very interesting point uh, because. He, your vision of the digital twin is, is critical because it's already happening. I really subscribe to that vision. And partly the work I've been doing is about this idea of creating identity. And that's why I created as well this podcast 
to create more digital visibility and as well more education. But the challenge, and that comes back to the first question and the first comment that we did together, that is about the challenge that we have between independence of the internet and data, the governments and the big corporations. So, and I think we cannot change this unless we change education, unless we change a lot of, it's much more um, holistic approach than anything else. So I would like to hear your your views of this digital twin and as well, how do you make the bridge between the technology part, which is your area of expertise, and you have a massive track record on that, but as well then the political, the social, and as well the humanitarian part, which is critical as well here, because like you said, for instance, uh, we're working with the uh, there's platforms for Africa, there's platforms, but in the end of the day, at the moment, the biggest platform in the world is Facebook, whatever we like it or not, and it's controlled 60% by Mark Zuckerberg. So you can actually decide about, never in history of mankind, someone could decide about so much people as Mark Zuckerberg. He's actually the biggest owner of all our ecosystems in the planet. And you see that mostly he, he made the Brexit and he made as well what is happening in the United States, whatever you like it or not. Um, and I'm not going to politics. I'm just going purely <laughs> from facts. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, no, so I think on this digital twin, which I think is critical, and this is not just for us personal, but as well for the institutions, for the governments, because uh, with COVID-19, for instance, there was a study that was released actually this week. And, the, and I know that this is the context that you push in three hold. I think $83 trillion are going to be the cost of COVID-19 for the world economy. That is actually the cost of the world economy. <laughs> the world economy is around $70 trillion. So we are talking between 70 to 80. Wow. I didn't know that. So that means we're going to not only destroy the part of that, a lot of things, but, but as well, there's a lot. Yeah, it's a study that was launched today. Of course, there's all these studies you can put, but it makes sense because if you look that there's already $10 trillion that were invested so far uh, between the US and the rest of the world. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Of course, this is in the next two or three years. Um, but well, my, my question is coming back to the digital twins. I just want to context to this. So um, how do you see that vision? And as well as an entrepreneur that build a lot of companies, you have a lot of experience with investors, with governments, with policymakers with regulators so you have that experience but of course it's from the theory to the practice okay i'll give you the news anyhow <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to do it but okay you asked me the specific question and i'm really honestly amazed you found this letter to pin that was in 2018 so that's like more than two years ago how did you it's find still that? relevant it's still relevant <laughs> well i'm to be honest i didn't think about that anymore but I just took it back and I'm like oh damn indeed I wrote that at one point in time and it's indeed still relevant okay but that's really funny thank you for bringing that one up um yes well actually today we have a first version of it by the way um we we already demonstrated that to um, even a group in the government where we show them how you can use something like a digital twin to usually simplify the way how in this case it was in a sort of government use case people giving them their email and their calendaring and their think about it like uh, a google docs mail chat blah 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 thing together right and that we already have we can show that today and it's very impressive and uh, we could demonstrate that the power usage was going to be a fraction and um i had lots of benefits right so that was like a first version we did it's a working prototype this is not the final thing we want to put on the market but it's working and it's provable and we can show it so that's where we are today uh, but now I want to go to a second version, because if you create startups, your first version is never the one who breaks through. You always need the second version or sometimes even a third version. But if you, don't, if you go too quickly out, then you get stuck because you get too many requests and too many users and it becomes too hard to innovate, right? And that's why we keep it still a little bit quiet. So the news actually is that uh, we are creating a new company called the Crystal Company. And the Crystal Company will be the home of our Crystal Twin. So you're actually the first guy hearing about that. Um, in a couple of months, there will be a website about it. Um, it's being prepared and everything. But that will be, uh, this company will also live under our foundation. So it will be also non-for-profit. Uh, there will be investors, but the investors will get their money back by a certain predefined way. We still have to define that. Is that a loan or some revenue thing or whatever? But there will be no shareholders getting, at least no founder shareholders, other people getting money out of that. I really want the Crystal Company to be very, very, very pure in such a way that we can create a second version. 
so that this second version will be the basis of our digital life. And we're already working on it from out of our incubator with very good success. So that soon in three, four, five months from now, the first use cases will be alive uh, to basically allow us to become free on this internet for certain use cases. And then we will grow from there. The business case will be a number of dollar a month kind of business case, you know, where you pay a certain fee because yeah, if you're not a product like in a Facebook or something else, then yeah, you have to pay something. It doesn't have to be expensive, but you will have to pay something for having your full digital life. But look, if you have 10 million people giving a dollar per month for having a digital life, you still have a substantial amount of money, which can be used to give people a digital life. So this will be part of a company which is truly non for profit still with investors who want to do well, who will have their return. And we are actually getting very close to coming to first use cases where everything from you will be arranged around you. Um, and we will start with identity, like because that's a step number one. Anyhow, identity, file storage, um, some other things around that. That's sort of the plan. Yeah. No, they're amazing, and uh, I think it's something that I, whatever I can do to help, I'm here. And I think it's so. So I think to um, to wrap up, and I think we passed the one hour benchmark. Um, normally, our, our goal is one hour, more or less. So I, I, there's a lot of questions that I have, but I think we'll take probably from a second interview when I see you guys uh, doing more stuff, and I'm sure a lot of things will happen. So. Um, you have the humanitarian parts of you, and uh, there's even another article from yours that I really like about uh, keeping your values and you touch that as well. But uh, one other thing, or the art of being loyal to our values, I love that. So as a wrap up, as, so you have three angles that are particularly important for any business. So in one end, there's a, a very strong uh, technological background that is uh, the, the nerd part of yours that we all have, but you have, have much more experience <laughs> on that. You have the, the entrepreneurial and as well the ambition in terms of building big ideas together as well humanitarian part which I like a lot so on that context how do you put the three hold in the committee that you build because we have the open source committee where why this open source committee is still not completely blockchain uh, evangelized um, there, there's there as well all the challenge right now with artificial intelligence we didn't touch that but it's critical especially with ID and everything I'm sure that you're doing so yeah just as a kind of a last remark probably if you want to touch a bit of these areas and as well the, how do you see this, especially the, the bridges between the identity, the, the evolution of the singularity that is going to happen, and as well, all the infrastructure technology that we're talking as well, uh, probably to make it more complex as well, the sustainability, because I know that one of your challenges with Rehold is to, to build a more um, sustainable and green infrastructure of technology, which is critical because blockchain, is, uh, blockchain especially crypto, uh, and um, even Ethereum, but especially Bitcoin is massive. There's still a lot of issues to be fixed. Although a lot of people try to fix it, but it's still not fixed. Yeah. Well, first of all, we do it in a different way. Yeah? It's not a real blockchain, actually. It's something different. We're using blockchain IDs, for sure. Like we have our own blockchain database, but it's a different concept. Um, more like cells in the body, like we discussed. Now, look, the, like I said, we have a first version, so we can now prove to people that it can be done. This, we are beyond that step. Whoever wants to see, we can show. The next step is that we are working together with our community to define the next one because that's why it's important to identify our partners. This is not something we're going to do alone, right? Obviously not. There are many people with beautiful ideas, uh, social media or this or that or whatever, which are looking for a more neutral backend. But they have lots of requirements. So the phase we are in, and we're basically inviting everyone who hears this, that if you would like to be part of defining this future, which is now going very fast, we need to define together what is this language of this new interhuman digital twin, if you want, right? What do we need as the base features? We have made a prototype, like I said, but there are many other things we need to think about. So we need help for that. So whoever would like to be part of defining these things, we can then sort of get that in our community. We can, we can have define it together because the idea is that uh, web developers or people who have applications can, with not too much effort, uh, migrate over to this fully peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure so they no longer have to rely on decentralized infrastructure so they can do it peer-to-peer. And that way it can become a backend for many use cases, like AI being one. But in our case, like AI needs a lot of data. In our case, you would be the owner of the data. So you give um, 
basically you would know when an AI needs your data and you would and you would give permission. Maybe you would even share in some revenue or something, who knows, right? But all these new ideas need to come to life. To basically round off, if if you listen to I, uh, Buckminster or, or Einstein, they said the same thing. They said we cannot resolve a problem uh, by repeating what we did before. So we need to completely rethink out of the box. And I think that's what we did with this crystal twin or this tree bot technical name. So we completely rethought how it will work, how people will communicate, where your data is, how we store the data. It's a very, very different paradigm. So we, now we need to invite people to come to us and basically we want to offer our help to allow them to be fully peer-to-peer -peer and then we can learn from them to know how to write down the primitives and create the primitives of the new version of the tree bot. Fantastic. So, so I, I have a lot of other questions, but I'll leave it probably for a second interview. Um, we will definitely uh, be putting all the links to Freehold and, and uh, all the different things that you've been doing. Um, and as well, the, the, there's really ambition, but as well, like you said, the pragmatic sense of making this happen. And as well, I think your experience as one of the leading entrepreneurs in Europe as well, and as well, building a lot of companies and the experience with that is, is particularly important as well, because I think a lot of the business models around the, this kind of innovation, they fail because people have the ambition, but they forgot the rest. So I think, <laughs> uh, I think it's really important that we, we put that in detail. So I really, it's been a pleasure, Christopher. There's a lot of things actually that I still have. We'll take it for a second because it's already a long interview. Thank you yeah. so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, really. Thank you.